thank you everybody for coming. We're going to get started now. So we're very excited to have Andrew Moore come and speak again at AI Lunch. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, Andrew Moore is very excited to come and speak again at uh, the AI Lunch also. Uh, so. <coughs> Uh, as I will often say, uh, please, please do interrupt me at any time with questions or comments. This, even more than my previous talk, is meant to be a two-way conversation. Uh, it is about something that uh, an old friend of mine from Google and myself have been working on with uh, some of the leaderships of the big corporate search engines, as well as a bunch of uh, enthusiastic government agencies and then some other academics. Uh, and it's a potential initiative uh, which looks more and more realistic that it bec become a major uh, uh, activity that uh, the country could get involved in. So uh, I'm going to try to do two things, three things. First, and this is actually harder than it sounds, describe what the this is. Second, uh, describe what the impact would be and third, give a kind of map as to where we think there are technologies to already support this and where we think there's new work that needs to be done. So that's what I'm going to try to get done. I have no idea if I'm going to manage this, but I want to see if I can get that done in about 40 minutes so we have a good 20 minutes to just discuss amongst ourselves. Because in this room, there are people who are, on every single item I touch on, there are people who've got expertise which vastly exceeds my own or anyone else on this team. So I want to get that feedback. All right, uh, it's even possible that, yep, yeah, there he is. Guha, are you watching? Yes, I am. Okay, so my uh, co-presenter is sitting there in that little box. Uh, <laughs> and if I say something stupid, we'll hear him sh shouting. Uh, the goal is we ignore it, whatever it is, okay? So <laughs> you hear this little voice complaining, forget about it. Uh, Guha uh, is, uh, was a, uh, uh, a Google fellow uh, at Google, for, uh, actually responsible for many of the new features that you've so seen come into Google over many years. Prior to that, he was the originator of the idea of, uh, of RSS feeds, and he built up the initial infrastructure for that. Uh, prior to that, actually maybe after that, he created a company called ePinions, which is a perfect example of one of the very first places which looked at how you uh, tag uh, or get crowdsourced opinions as to whether some organization or some product is a good thing or a bad thing. And the very interesting thing is that prior to that, Guha was uh, one of the chief leads at Psyche, uh, an ancient project now to have computers understand all the objects in the world. So uh, he's got a very interesting perspective uh, on this whole topic. So we're going to talk about something called the Open Knowledge Network. So uh, in the context of the, the previous talk I gave, this is about one box which I skipped over, which is, uh, <coughs> in my opinion, when we're describing what's going on with uh, artificial intelligence in gen general, a key piece of glue which will hold together many of the applications of AI across many industries uh, is the notion of entities and first class object identifiers for entities and then facts about relations between entities. So let's jump into that uh, in much more detail. So you've all seen this and you've actually probably noticed it's in theory getting smarter as the years go by. Knowledge graphs <coughs> and search. So uh, two or three years ago if you type in into Bing or Google uh, something like Peter Gabriel concert dates, there would be a textual match on some of those unigrams and bigrams, maybe trigrams, to point you to documents which were probably relevant to your query. And a huge amount of work went into uh, trying to tune that matching process so that it would be the documents which would be relevant. Now more than ever before, the big race is on among all the search engines to instead figure out directly what your intent was in that query and give you the results straight away in some structured form. So in this example on Bing actually does manage to give you a little table. So does this example uh, on Google. So these are both nice things, but they are, our thesis is this is the start of something huge. Uh, and it's all to do with the fact that this industry, which has 
uh, some people believe has made us all smarter. The industry of search engines and getting help uh, is moving away from heuristically finding documents uh, to the dream, which we've all talked about before even the current generation of search engines were built, to things which figure out what you want and provide you with the right answer to that without just giving you a link to some other document. There are many reasons for this change. Of course, one obvious one is we can. Uh, the technology is there. There was a couple of uh, important DARPA projects uh, around 2000, uh, Kalo and Radar, uh, which led to the creation uh, and huge amounts of work done here, by the way, on those projects. Uh, that led indirectly to uh, the formation of a bunch of companies, some of which have then been acquired by search engines. For instance, Siri is based on a company which formed through uh, the Radar program, uh, which means that we now can actually try to do this sort of thing. And the battle here is fierce. This is the reason that if you're a student sitting here in this room, uh, you're going to see, you, if you want to, when you graduate, you can just basically ask these four companies to do a knife fight in front of you uh, to choose which of the four you're going to work for, because they're all desperate for you. So that's actually a very interesting and nice thing, because there's a huge uh, gold rush towards coming up with the best uh, technology for doing these kinds of question answering uh, as soon as possible. And... And this is one of the reasons why giving a set of 10 documents is no longer a good thing. Many of these are based around speech, and some of them, such as uh, Amazon Echo and Google's knockoff of it, uh, are really trying to just, you verbally ask a question and you verbally get given an answer and response. In many cases, uh, we do expect that the right thing is you verbally ask a question and you get a picture or an image or an interactive experience in response. But it's no longer the case that we are going to be satisfied with getting 10 blue links in response, having to read those little snippets and pick one of those uh, on the off chance that it answers our question. And of course, uh, something which makes me really happy, but in fact also makes me a little bit stressed out, is that this university is a very, very strong pioneer in this whole area. Uh, and just recently, some of the great examples here are the live QA uh, uh, competition. 11 out of the 11 tracks, can the email and one. Uh, the NIST IARPA video understanding competition. CMU has almost every year for the last five years won it. And another really nice result that's just come out is on the bi biology question answering system, uh, Eric and his grad students have uh, had some great success with these. Are any of the folks involved in any of these things in this room right now? Congratulations, I'm really, really proud of what you've done. All right, great. So, lots of this stuff is happening here. What drives it? One of the things that drives it is stuff, again, that most of it originated here over the decades, which is the speech recognition and the understanding uh, and uh, other work to do with the action side of once you've understood the question, providing a good answer to it. Uh, one of our strategic hires in HCII in the last five years was Niki Kitor, who is the world expert, in my opinion, in answering the big questions. If your question is going to be answered not by a factoid, like if you ask a question like, which school should I send my kid to, and you want a little report, he's the guy to do it. So with all of this, we're in a great position. I mentioned I was stressed about our success here. The thing that stresses me is I can see this really exciting area of research suddenly getting, or slowly, getting taken away from us in the academic world. And the reason it can get taken away from us in the academic world is you cannot have a question, useful question answering system without knowledge probably that knowledge needs to have very good semantics underneath it. You need to know about all the facts. You can't write a great uh, navigation geographical information system uh, without a map of a city. Similarly, many of these questions, especially when they compose multiple concepts, you have to have the knowledge to support it. What if we enter a world of walled gardens where the only people able to do interesting <coughs> research and come up with new things to delight the world's population other ones inside the walls of those four companies. 
then a lot of bad things will happen. Uh, for me, the very worst of all the things that will happen is, uh, as we've already seen in this entire industry for its last 30 years, the exciting new big ideas have come out of universities uh, and asterisk CMU. So uh, we, we want that to continue. But just as in the world of computer graphics, there came a, a, a turnover point where uh, it became actually hard to do such impressive stuff in academia as you could do in industry because the resources in industry are so great. In this occasion, the resources, uh, uh, I'm speaking for Guha as well as myself here, the main resource which we're missing or we're worried about missing out on is the knowledge graph to support the answers to these questions. So that's the theme. <coughs> it's the question, how can we make sure that there is a big knowledge graph? Uh, I'm going to talk about this a little bit more later on. It's not just about us academics getting access to data. There's also a bunch of related problems, such as, really, if you're looking at something obscure like uh, <coughs> fossils, uh, ancient, ancient fossil information, it would be insane to imagine a world where Microsoft, Google, Apple, uh, uh, the other one, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> Amazon, <laughs> Uh, and in fact, Facebook all independently had teams going out and mapping all the, the uh, geological knowledge in the world. Of course, what you need to do is have a place where everything puts things together. <coughs> this is especially obviously true when you look at some of the first things that have happened with these question answering systems on search engines. The first, actually still, the main useful source of data for all of these nice QA things is Wikipedia, something which was created by a by a whole community working together to put in information. So uh, uh, we are going to talk later about how we can create a knowledge graph, not just to make academics work well or be able to innovate, but also just to make it so that the knowledge for people to put front ends on uh, is more generally available. What I'm going to do now, uh, I found that when I describe the architecture or the potential architecture of these things, I sound very vague. So what I want to do is ground this with an example, which I happen to be very familiar with in the world of internet shopping, to how something much more specific than general question answering is architected. <coughs> I want to show you the players, the, the, the computational and systems infrastructure parts that you put in there, so that after that we can uh, uh, sort of expand that to what you can do for a uh, for an entire uh, uh, question answering system. So here we're going to take an example of someone has typed in digital pen into a search engine and as of two years ago uh, the results which came up uh, included in a very simplistic way these mentions of a bunch of entities which are turn out to actually be <coughs> digital pens. There's no very fancy technology, or apparently, uh, in this. But I still want to talk about how the underlying system is architected to produce those results. Because that'll give us a common language when we then talk, in, talk about speculating on how a na national knowledge graph would work. So the two places at the very center of the architecture of a system like this are uh, something we're going to call decorated entities, and I'll explain more later about what they are. You can think of this as uh, a big, uh, maybe a NoSQL database with a bunch of keys for all the products which are for sale in the world. And they're decorated in the sense that they've probably got some extra attributes uh, with some sort of conventionally understood semantics about them, like their price, or their weight, or their dimensions, or an image. Uh, and then maybe enough of an identifier that they can be linked to reviews where people have given free text descriptions of, of these things. So that decorated entities thing, which in the world of shopping is usually called a catalog, is the center of the whole architecture. You have to have that. And you'll notice how this is different from what we might have talked about when building a conventional search engine, which you'd have talked about a document store. This is an entity store, and it's very different. So, one of the first major pieces of work that you have to do when you're setting this up is ingest unstructured facts 
uh, in this case in the world of retail, and somehow have a live system which keeps on ingesting them and helping make sure the decorated entities get better and better. So to do that, you usually have, it looks like such a small box, but there are you know, multiple large engineering teams in multiple locations around the world working on components of that box. The box says normalize, and that is the place where every mention of the Logitech Digital I.O. pen uh, is very carefully converted to using the same key. And as much as possible, and ideally uh, as automatically as possible, if there is a logical digital pen IO 2.1 pen, that is actually uh, understood to be a different object and we record the relationships between them. That's something that you'll have seen on Amazon if you are uh, uh, about to buy something and it, then it says a newer version of this product is available or you want to look at the product line for something or you want to look at the uh, most similar products in someone else's product line. So lots and lots of work goes into that. In fact, in a very different way of thinking than uh, I used to think about before I went into industry, uh, there is a huge amount of human effort in this as well. So the systems to make this normalized and reliable set of decorated entities, we're looking at precisions like 99.9% uh, for uh, correct normalization. Uh, recall can be lower, but it still has to be pretty high. It turns out, at least when I was involved in this, we weren't able to automatically get up to those levels. There was huge amounts of work for machine learning algorithms which could hit 92, 95, maybe even 98%. But that still meant when you're dealing with billions of products that you've got thousands of people around the world who are helping with those very rare corner cases to make sure that this uh, decorated entity set is high quality. Now remember, this piece of work is being done in an environment where there's a lot of money to be made by getting it right. And so it is worth having huge teams of talented engineers working really, really hard to get this normalization correct. And it is worth it to, if necessary, hire armies of people to do manual tagging and manual deduplication in order to create this decorated entity set. And bear that in mind when we talk about what's going to happen when we want to do this for geology, where there is not a billion dollars to be made by doing geology entities well. All right, next part of the system. Once you've got your decorated entities, that's when you can start to come up with a serving, type, a serving system. Everything we've seen at the moment is what you call back end. It is stuff which uh, actually runs continuously to constantly uh, update your system of truth about all the entities that are out there. But it's, that thing by itself is pointless. The reason it's there is for the serving system, where if someone gives you a query, your goal is within 0.2 of a second to come up with a result set for them, uh, where this result set is likely, very, very likely, to include the entities which best match the query. So if the query is uh, uh, for a specific item, you really want to show a lot of information about that item. If the query is for a general set of items, like uh, digital pens, then what you want is to come up with a set of representative digital pens which you think the user is most likely to be interested in, and so forth. <coughs> to do this, this is where some of the world's biggest machine learning systems are in place at the moment, because you have to have a model which helps you take a set of, take a query, and then for every possible decorated entity, ask the question, what is the probability that the user will be happy to be shown this model? Which very approximately you could say, what is the probability that the user will click on this thing if it's shown uh, this entity? So you want to iterate over all possible entities, give them the query, and predict the probability that the user will click on or some other confidential measure of apparent happiness for their interaction with this thing. To train up the model, you have to have the decorated entities. Uh, and you also have a huge amount of training data in the form of click streams and other information you might have about the context in which this search is happening. For instance, more and more, you may uh, be in a situation where 
uh, you know where the user is physically when they're asking this question. And your answer is probably <coughs> going to be different if they're standing in a Best Buy when they're asking the question versus if they're in an airport. So there's much more to this. Uh, once, once the, the punchline is, once you have that set of decorated entities, the world is your oyster and you can go nuts. Uh, uh, and there's beautiful research problems all over this diagram in terms of making this experience better uh, for the model, for getting the decorated entities better, and for doing other much higher level things, such as uh, really helping people understand whether these products are good, using crowdsourced information about whether people liked the object, were happy with it, whether which functions it does well at, and so forth, finding out stuff to do with fraud. You could start to build up these wonderful things, and in the internet companies, this is exactly what is happening right now, based on that decorated entity store. That decorated entity store is incredibly important, and you really want to get it right. What's uh, Consumer or customer ops, uh, just uh, helping folks who've got questions. Uh, you really want to be able to make that much more efficient for them. Yes. Okay. So I've talked here about the world of shopping, which is, it's actually a leading indicator of what we can do with this technology, because as I said before, there's, it's a very commercially important area, and so it's worth channeling massive uh, work into it. I'm actually almost regretful and embarrassed that we, as a society, we have not put anywhere near the amount of effort into uh, helping ask a question, perhaps related to healthcare. We know that about 8% of all internet search queries are related to healthcare, and many of these actually are people who've not talked to a physician, don't know very much about it, but are just worried about something. First thing they do is come in, type in a query, and at the moment, even now, usually they just get back the set of 10 blue links. They do not get that kind of expert help. Wouldn't it be nice if they, we were able to give them a more structured uh, answer about their question? So these are things that we can do right now. That last bullet, call me an Uber, is a very, very important uh, example because it is showing how search engines, especially as we start to put them with voice and on mobile devices, are turning more into concierges or the dream of a personal assistant, which I first heard about when I uh, uh, arrived here as a young green uh, professor in 1994 and Tom Mitchell, uh, and in fact, Herb Simon were talking about how this is the future. We will all have digital personal assistance, and it's really happening now. So it's not just a question of answering questions. It's a question of usefully obeying commands. Call me an Uber. That maybe that's what's uh, uh, there right now, but soon will come. Uh, you know, help me decide where my kid could go, go, to go to school. Please arrange dinner for me tonight, uh, and, and so forth. Please placate my angry provost for me. Uh, all right. So these are actually the kind of questions uh, that this working group who got together are using as the sort of motivational uh, uh, points. And especially, you'll see some differentiation here from what uh, some of the classical search engines might want. So the first uh, is actually related to something that uh, Manuela, Bill Sherless, Travis Bro, uh, Matthias Grabmer, uh, and I were uh, at a meeting last night with some lawyers talking about artificial intelligence in the regulatory world. And this is something that's very, very important. Again, you type in that right now, you're just going to get a set of documents. And in fact, because your question is so long, it probably won't actually go through parsing. Uh, you'll probably get pretty crappy results. Uh, but then, these last four, you're seeing questions which actually aren't expecting a factoid answer. They are asking for some kind of analysis. Uh, uh, for instance, uh, this is something which, at the moment, this last one, a biology <coughs> researcher may ask to their grad student, and their grad student has to scurry off and spend a few weeks working on this. Uh, and so these are wonderful things to imagine that QA systems will have. And it's tantalizingly close to conceivable that we can do this with current technology. We're not looking at any big unexplored part of uh, 
AI to get this stuff going, except we need that uh, uh, knowledge graph. So here I've set up, and I've hoped I've, hoped I've given a passionate plea for why uh, like the whole world depends on us having a great national or international knowledge graph, like Wikipedia, only entirely machine readable, and with trillions of pages, not merely eight million. Yep. It, oh, it's definitely feasible. The question is the degree to which we can get, can get here. And there is a, an incredibly weak link that I'm going to, one of the slides is going to have a weak link on it. Everything else I'm pretty confident about. Uh, but this is definitely at the level where, you know, if we're inspiring a new political administration to uh, invest in growth areas, there's, there, there, this, this looks like it's going to make a big difference to us. <coughs> Yes, please. It assumes that everybody agrees on the truth. Because I'm like, because the population Yes. Yes, this is a big problem. Uh, it's a, I'm looking at Roni in the back of the room because. Uh, especially in developing countries, it's absolutely the case that we, can't, we Western folks can't just say, no, this is the, the science truth, you've got to accept it. That's true, that's true. So, when you're looking at how you actually, rep the entities themselves are usually, that's hard enough. When we, as later on we talk about how you represent facts or relationships between entities, a very important feature of this representation language will be an assertion was made by such and such person on such and such date that such and such entity is related to such and such other entity in the following way. So that, and the example that we're using is uh, the assertion that Christopher Columbus discovered America in 1492. You probably want to have that snippet there, but you can't, you can't state that as the gospel fact because really we all know that everything is much more complex than that. So you do... One of, one of the many uh, dozens of difficult knowledge representation tasks will be how you represent facts which are, you're actually representing that this is an assertion made by somebody else about this, as opposed to this is, uh, this is the gospel truth assertion. So it's a big problem, and it's getting very close to the weak link in all of this, which I promised Manuela. Okay, yep. So, uh, so the question was, what are the challenges when it comes to sensors or, or big sensor networks around the world? In fact, when we talk uh, later on about some of the use cases here, it isn't all actually about question answering. There's a well-known robotics problem right now, which is, it seems ridiculously trivial in comparison with this fancy stuff, which is if a robot enters a room and wants to understand what's in the room, it actually does need to look at things and understand not just <laughs> physically, whether they're physical dimensions, but what they are, what they mean. And to do that, so you actually do need a knowledge graph to do this. Abhinav Gupta in the Robotics Institute is uh, now doing the first thing that I've ever seen where uh, you're actually getting training data for robots to understand small physical entities by manipulating them and understanding that so that the, the decorated information about a banana isn't just about its nutrition uh, and its imagery, but actually chemical composition and first and second moments of inertia. Yep. Uh, once we get to this kind of questions, it looks much more similar to what our friends at IBM are doing, especially with Watson, and given how much work they put in that. But you did mention the number of the four competitors. Do you think that Watson is doing something wrong? Yes. Or not? No, no. Ro Watson is great, and Watson is very much in the middle of all this. I was talking about the consumer-facing world. What you're seeing happening in the industry is these four companies are going directly to the consumers. One company, IBM, very smartly is saying, well, all of this is going to really affect how businesses work because finally we can actually have a 
a representation where we've got primary keys and technology to do fuzzy matches with those primary keys to run businesses. Uh, so yes, uh, I, I was not talking about the B2B side of this, I was talking about the B2C side of this. Microsoft is also sort of edging towards the Watson proto market as well. All right, I'm gonna move on. And I think uh, judging by these questions, I think some of the next few slides will help uh, deal with this. Okay, so now I'm actually going to start talking about what the architecture of something like this might be. And at one point in this, you're going to see the really cagey difficult part. So quickly now, this is more like a, a, a design doc. It's just taking you through some of the concepts uh, in all of this. For now, we're going to say an entity is a concept from some domain, uh, and it can be as, as sort of obvious as the Eiffel Tower uh, or the H2N2 virus as a general form. Uh, you can have an entity for what it means to be a department of music in general, but there might be an entity of the department of music in at CMU, and that is a different entity. So uh, in this space, if you look what the architecture in the internet companies are at the moment, it's fairly general space like this. And there are many entity stores out there already. Uh, and probably the, the perfect example uh, of how this can all work for the, for the general betterment is geographical information systems, which really came to their peak about five or six years ago. And now you are seeing lots of applications, including third-party applications, which are able to do things which no one had thought of before because we can all write software which reasons about not just the layout of roads, but the exact dynamics of intersections and the uh, categories of businesses uh, uh, on those roads. And as we start to think of this more as a graph and less of a specific domain, uh, linkages to the inventories of the retail stores on those roads. So if you want to say, I, I need a box of Advil, uh, you, your car can actually guide you to the place en route to somewhere else where you can get that Advil. And then what we hope to go with this is that box of Advil, which contains one particular chemical compound uh, inside it, we have a link to that where we actually know about the chemistry of this compound. And from that, we link to the papers uh, which have talked about understanding that chemistry. This is what gets people excited about the concept of a knowledge graph. And here are so many uh, other examples. Uh, and I'm gonna talk a lot more about schema.org in just a moment. So the architecture includes this thing which I previously mentioned as decorated entities. Uh, and this is a very big, and for any of us who are here have ever looked at the sort of formal semantics of uh, information, somewhat distasteful, uh, low semantic uh, set of unique IDs combined with a bunch of information uh, about each of those entities, uh, including titles, uh, short mentions, long mentions, synonyms, uh, images, in some cases, physical dimensions, uh, and uh, each of these kinds of things. Now, one part of the uh, architecture diagram for shopping, which I showed you, was this component, which is, uh, this, this is one place where you really do need to have large serving systems. Uh, and by serving, I mean large sets of computers which can answer questions very, very quickly in real time, not in, uh, not in a batch mode. So if you're looking at a piece of text and there's a mention in it, where the mention might be Logitech's new digital IO stylus, then the matching engine is the piece of technology which, given that, comes up usually with some list of possible matches of entities. Frequently, when you actually look at how these lists work, you get into problems because when one entity is an instance of another or a subset of another, it's sort of complicated to guess <coughs> which level you're talking about. And usually what a matching engine will do is return a set of stuff and then leave it up to the application writer 
writer to decide what they want to do with the set of mentions. Maybe they have additional context where they can do an inference to find out what was being mentioned. Maybe it turns out that it doesn't really matter if you get it exactly correct what the entity was that are being mentioned. But this is a, the second of the big pieces of technology you need uh, for a open knowledge network based question answering system. The third, this is the weak link. This is the place where I'm kind of standing before you without any clothes because uh, what, to my knowledge, we've done in industry is very, very simplistic. Uh, and the whole, the whole area here has got to make a decision as to whether to go for simplistic stuff and try to find as many use cases where it works or really try to come up with this very old chestnut of AI, which is how you do proper knowledge representation about facts. So one of the things that the knowledge graph and Amazon's equivalent of, equivalent of it do is a very weak semantics uh, system where you represent knowledge as a bunch of uh, triples, which are entity one, relationship name, entity two. And if you're building a shopping app, that's okay. You can actually say uh, green, entity green, is the color of the Xbox three, and you're all set. Now, that's a very, very weak set of semantics, so the people writing a question answering system on it have to know a lot about what you intended when you put in that fact. So, this is something which I'm scared about. This is very hard. It might even be so hard that it means that we should actually put off this project for five years. Uh, what Guha and I would like to see happen uh, is uh, we do actually start, start right away down this path, including using these very simplistic triples, which are offensive to us as computer scientists, especially computer scientists who are used to probabilistic statements or statements in which you have to account for the fact that this statement is an assertion by this other, by this other person. It's not a, uh, a gospel fact. So uh, that is the very hard part of all of this. Uh, I don't know if many folks in the room would agree here, but we, uh, while we can say we computer scientists have kind of solved speech, solved computer vision, uh, solved uh, autonomous navigation on roads, there's some other things that we computer scientists have kind of sucked at. And how you should actually do this is one of these. If we end up with these simple semantics, uh, my belief is we can still make great progress with being able to answer very large sets of questions which help people make decisions. If we fix on one representation or semantics of the representation and say, well, we're going to use this for the next 20 years, of course we're in trouble. What I would like is 30 or 40 mortal enemy research groups across the country who've got their theory as to what the right version is of how to do the semantics, how to incorporate probability, how to incorporate provenance. Uh, uh, and there's a big intellectual war to find the most useful uh, semantics uh, for for, for how we deal with these. So that's the weak link. Very confident about catalog, very confident about matching engine. Facts, uh, if you look very carefully at what happens when you do question answering systems on your devices right now, which feel very powerful, a lot of the reasons that they feel powerful is because cleverly the user interface has been designed so that you can get away with out having deep semantics here. Okay, now back onto uh, stuff which I feel confident about, but I'm out of time, so I'm gonna move very quickly through this. We've, we've really pushed this in terms of being able to answer fact questions and then research questions. The difference between these, a factoid question is kind of what you usually expect from Alexa right now. Uh, you're gonna get a quick sentence in reply. A research question is something which you'd often in the real world have a human advisor, like a doctor or a concierge or a lawyer to answer for you verbally and maybe sort of draw diagrams <coughs> for you. Uh, I mentioned this one. Uh, 
One of the interesting issues in robotics at the moment is we can build a robot which perhaps uh, a military person who's trying to clear a building can use to send in a small robot to check a building is safe, but that robot has to actually understand what it's seeing in those and get the meaning out of those. So that's why uh, there are several programs now about knowledge-powered robotics which need this just as much as these uh, consumer types of things. <coughs> so when it comes to, and you'll notice by the way, I'm now talking about building the catalog or the decorated entity set. When it comes to doing this, uh, I'm much more confident. There are probably many ways to do it, uh, but uh, we've seen many instances of this succeeding. How you will build one of these knowledge stores, there is a great deal of uh, math and clustering technology, especially to normalize plenty of mentions to deal with apparently conflicting information. There's plenty of crowdsourcing work, also being pioneered here at Carnegie Mellon to do with having humans uh, doing active learning or semi-supervised learning methods for uh, helping improve these knowledge bases and having a clustering algorithm or a normalization algorithm be able to request a human to, to help them as they're doing this. So there are a bunch of ways we can do this. What uh, Guhar and I and the rest of this group are, are very clear about is we do not expect there to be a central agency sort of dictating uh, how this is done or that uh, we'll be using the kind of techniques that, for instance, were used by the uh, ICD-10 committee for coming up with the coding scheme for chief complaints in medical records. Well, that was a very large, mostly manual effort uh, to produce, in that case, only tens of thousands of named entities. And another form pioneering approach, which, uh, again, a, a related group of people here at, in Pittsburgh have really pushed on, is... Uh, read the web type approaches, which actually try to build these things by reading other documents. Uh, yeah. So that, that's a very interesting point, I think, uh, as to who is going to control this. And, and if there is a global store, so you said what it's not going to be, there's not going to be a global committee who's going to do it, so what is it going to be? So the question of, suppose someone claims they want to publish a useful uh, uh, knowledge graph about fossils. You can imagine acceptance test methodologies where you have uh, humans who say, all right, you claim these two are the same, same type of fossil. I disagree. Uh, and then you start to build up golden sets to decide if this is all right or not. And then there's a real comp uh, golden sets. So. Uh, examples from humans who've done a huge amount of painful work to come up with examples to test a clustering or normalization algorithm on. Uh, and then the competition, where you're seeing uh, this happening across many government agencies now, and even inside some, uh, some companies, is given examples of successful normalizations, uh, come up with a system which can do uh, general uh, high quality normalization. So the, uh, the way of judging which normalized set of fossils you want to use out of the one that was produced by University of Stony Brook versus the one produced by NIST versus the one produced by the European Department of Fossils is based on how well they perform at these classic uh, normalization tests uh, that, that you will produce. So I, I understand that if there's a ground for right like that, and not, not really a lot of commercial competition, as you said, in that scenario. But if you have commercial competition, let's say two products, one claims to have a new feature, the, the other component doesn't have that feature, would have a strong incentive to say, okay, that's not even a feature, that's not even a relevant comparison feature. And yes, thing? so bad facts in these systems are a really terrifying uh, part of this, and especially as you start to get into contentious areas, and this is an area studied very much in the growth of Wikipedia uh, as to what happens when bad agents come in and try to change these. And guess what? I don't have an answer to that. This is, that's, yeah. That's precisely where triplets let you down completely because there's no place to put that information. Yes, exactly. So if there's, if, and 
in a company like Google with products, you can actually have a large team of people being paid to say, well, this is wrong. And then you, of course, have technology to say, this information source, which is pumping this in, fed me some misinformation. So it's going to have to have a lot more supporting evidence uh, for my subsequent information to do these. That's one of the reasons why, uh, and uh, I think it's hard to get Guha on the mic, but Guha would very much agree with this. We are not envisioning <coughs> doing this without uh, humans. If, and it's in these hierarchical editorial chains that you see with Slashdot or Wikipedia. And in some cases, if an agency has decided, I am going to release a fact base about all the entities involved in the process of pneumonia, uh, then we will decide whether that, uh, or a user will be able to decide whether that organization's facts are something that they want to use in their engines. And the view is that there is a global entity store. There's not a personal belief store for me and a different belief store for you. I think in the underlying architecture, and we're not going to have time to go into this, we are expecting that there's not going to be a single server with all of this data. That it really is uh, up to aggregators of various stages to decide which publishers they want to uh, receive information from, incorporate into their store for their own use. And it is possible and very serious to see how these things could be gained, gamed, but I at least passionately would, would argue that there's plenty of non-contentious areas, for instance, just helping someone understand, a veteran understand the rules to find out which hospital they can go to for a particular piece of help, where well, we're not going to have to the gaming question is not going to be our biggest concern. But don't forget, here we're advocating for a large research initiative around the country. And you look, uh, and it, when I share the slides, you'll see at the end of the slides how this committee has broken down many of these research areas, and they map on very closely to at least a dozen different things that we're doing here in Carnegie Mellon already to try to deal with these sub-problems. Anthony. So I'm sort of trying to characterize these techniques. They all, and what you described here, added a new element. So you're abandoning committee approaches um, and sort of viewing everything as there's this source that generates data, and then the task is to sort of integrate and approve the data. And in fact, in your original uh, uh, diagram, you didn't actually have an arrow that goes from the people who have the standard back to the original data source. And there are examples, very successful examples, for instance, Google Transit, where Google said, look, if you're a transit agency and you publish your schedule, we will put it on Google. And overnight, you know, thousands of agencies will publish Absolutely. It. And I know that Guha, sitting on that end, is currently shouting, Andrew, tell them about schema.org. So I'm going, to, I'm going to describe this. But, but sort of taking that argument further along, you know, there were economic incentives for the industry to <coughs> label correctly, you know, billing procedures. So a lot of what you're describing, you haven't hit on sort of the economic incentives or regulatory uh, incentives. For instance, now there are um, agencies in the federal government that can ask any bank to standardize their data in a certain yep. way because they want to look at systematic risk. I mean, this really, you're that seems to be the place that you're going to get clean data, clean integrated data. Yes. By regulatory and economic levers, not uh, the next machine learning algorithm to do data integration. No, I th and I think this is, this is something that we would all agree to. There is a notion, and you definitely see this, where you are incentivized to publish good data. And I'm going to give some examples of this now. So schema.org is something which uh, has almost transformed the world of search, internet search. And yet, f many of us folks uh, on the outside who are not actually running our own websites or web, web domains are probably little aware of it and how much of an impact it has had. And it is one of the things most responsible for the increasing quality of web search results recently. So as you go to many web pages, and this is one which is about events in New York, you see a bunch of information about events coming up. This is great. And someone behind the scenes has done exactly what we're talking about in the world of, of uh, web front ends. They 
independently without having to subscribe to some national uh, definition of events have created a useful website which grows in success because uh, traffic goes to it because people find it useful and they are giving you something which you believe is a reasonable list of facts. Now here's what's interesting. If you look in the uh, these websites these days uh, in the source uh, uh, HTML uh, you will find lots of these things called tags where along with each piece of text uh, and this is in some of the header sections as well as in the text itself people have taken the time to in fact put in structured metadata about each of the things they're describing so that although the user who doesn't actually want to see the, geo the geolocation of the theater where this play is taking place uh, can't see it in the rendered version. It's actually tagged uh, in the information behind. Why is it tagged? Because it's economically useful for the people providing the data to tag it. Because this is what helps a search engine who's, for example, is saying, uh, I've got a user who wants to know all of the plays happening in this, uh, in these five blocks of New York. Uh, the scrapers can come through, get this information, and then package that up to give to the users. So one bright spark, and one of the reasons why we're optimistic that some of these apparently really hard questions are already being solved out there, is that this tagging approach where humans are writing the code which runs their websites are actually also going into the databases which manage those websites to have them produce tags with more structured machine-readable information so that search engines and other users can actually have these structured semantics rather than just the free text when they're building experiences on them. And this, by the way, is something uh, Guha runs a uh, schema.org uh, and has been witnessing the uh, huge growth of this. So at the moment, uh, about 30% of all the pages on the internet actually has schema.org tags. Now there's some other tagging systems which are, some of those are also very successful. There's a certain kind of tagging used for movies, another certain special kind of tagging used, used for products, uh, and some of those tags even include information about the inventory of those products. And so we're actually witnessing behind the uh, visual representation and the source code of users around the world uh, thoroughly tagging their sites with information about the insertions, that, assertions that their websites are making. And uh, we're now at the level where uh, we believe there's somewhere around two to three trillion, trag, trillion tags on the web, uh, and these tags are typically in the form of triples. So that's interesting. Now, the, it is still humorously chaotic. It's not the case that everyone in the world has uh, agreed on the same schema for how they're going to tag events. But it's nowhere near as bad as if it was just free text. We're somewhere in between those two things. And uh, the work that's going on, I'd say primarily in the search engine world, is uh, on, with this extra information about these tags, actually doing this canonicalization to say, oh yeah, these two published pieces of information are genuinely referring to the same thing. So one of the exciting starting points for this creation of a public open knowledge network is through crawling tags and constructing uh, entities out of that. So uh, I'm going to close at this point because uh, I had a chance to uh, push uh, some of the things that we're excited about. Uh, we don't, I, I will stick around for a little bit longer, but we're officially out of time, so anyone who wants to leave is welcome to leave. Uh, and then please send me follow-up email. Uh, there's a lot of interesting work to be done here, and we're looking for uh, help, feedback, uh, and suggestions on how to improve this. We also have a white paper written by this 16-person committee, which we're happy to share and, again, get feedback on. That's it for now. Thank you very much.